Welcome to Ask AI, the podcast that brings you insightful interviews and news from the world of Canadian artificial intelligence. This episode is sponsored by Microsoft Canada. Microsoft is committed to building trusted and responsible AI systems. To learn more, go to microsoft.com slash AI and check out their free AI business school to start building intelligence into your solutions today. We're also sponsored by Cinchi, the global leader in data fabric technology. Visit Cinchi.com to learn how to eliminate integration and turbocharge your AI transformation. Hello, AI enthusiasts. Welcome to another episode of the Ask AI podcast. And today we have special guest, Dr. Alana Fish. She is a assistant professor with a joint appointment in the departments of computing science and psychology at the University of Alberta. She's also a fellow at the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute and holds a CIFAR Canadian AI chair appointment. Her work combines her passions for an interest in computational linguistics and machine learning and neuroscience. She collects brain images of people reading to explore how the human brain handles the complexities of language to help computers get better at understanding language. Pretty exciting stuff. So we're very excited to chat with Dr. Alana Fish. Welcome to Ask AI. Thanks. I'm so excited to be here. Awesome. And, you know, one of the things that we touched on prior to starting this recording is the teaching side of AI. You know, we talk to folks in industry, we've been starting to speak with more academics like yourself, and there's a, there's a research piece, which we'll get into, but I'm just so curious about how do you keep up with the the pace of change in the field? What does teaching look like in this field? today. So I'd say I'd, I focus on what I would consider to be the foundation of machine learning. So what would you need to understand to understand the things that are happening now? Uh, so really the things that are behind AI are math, statistics, and programming. And so we talk about the math and the statistics behind sort of the core uh, techniques. And then we do the programming to make those work. And then we talk about sort of the overarching philosophies of making sure that we t- are testing our models properly in a way that would give us a good sense of how they would actually perform in practice. So those are the core things. And I, I mean, I think university education in general should be forward thinking in a way that's more general. So there's, you know, a technical degree would tell you how to use X package that was released this year. Uh, but a university degree should be the kind of education that lasts you, you know, decades. Fascinating. And what a succinct, clear and enticing way to put it. What do you need to understand to understand AI, like that is such a clear way of talking about those foundations and and makes a lot of sense. Now, for some of our listeners, they might be intimidated hearing about the foundations of AI being math, statistics, and programming. Like we all know that that's the underpinnings of AI, but it sounds daunting when you spell it out quite like that. (laughs) Do you have any tips or hints or inspiration for folks who maybe really want to get into this field, but are intimidated by even just the foundationals themselves? Um, Well, so I think there are many ways to appreciate AI and it is possible to be somebody who works with the packages that other people build and is totally successful and understands how to apply them uh, in application areas. And that's, you know, we, those people are important and they're the people that get AI out into the world. And then there are people who are trained so that they could build the next package if they wanted to. And so there's a difference between those two groups of people. Both of them are important to the field. And so if you really understand the math and the stats behind AI, you can be the kind of person who maybe builds the package, uh, builds new packages as new technologies come out. But if you want to use the packages, then you can understand it at a different level, which I think is absolutely fine and very valuable. Yeah. And and sounds like that's much more accessible for people like me. Uh, Yeah, right. Yeah. Who do play with these things, but are are non-technical ourselves. And it's our job to make sure that the way that we present our research is, you know, digestible for for people across multiple backgrounds. That's important. And I think the onus is really on, you know, the people who build the technology. Well, now you're really speaking my language because I'm obsessed with plain language, clarity, you know, helping people understand things. You know, obviously your research is quite complex. And even in in your bio, I I left out all the parts talking about semantics and corpora and uh, tried to simplify it for our audience to help them understand. 
why don't you share a little bit more about the research that you're doing, certainly both on the technical side and then maybe also with the like simplified version, like, let me break it down for you. Here's what I do. Here's all the technical jargon. And here's what that really means in breaking it down. Sure. Okay. I'll try my best. So when we train machine learning models, they oftentimes produce what we call representations. So this is particularly common in neural networks. So a neural network has many layers and at each one of the layers, you can extract the numbers that the network has computed at that layer and use that to represent the input. And depending on the task you're training the network to do, those representations will change in a way so that they, you know, serve the task you're trying to train the network to do. Those representations create a representation of the input. They tell us something about the features of the input. So if it's an image, uh, the representations in early layers can tell you about the number of straight lines, where the straight lines are. And as you get up further and further through the network, you get different kinds of representations that represent different kinds of information. And as you get to the very top layers of the, the uh, neural network, you get representations that tell you what is the identity of the object in the network, if that's what you're training the network to do. What's the identity of the object in the image? Those representations, it turns out, are really correlated to the brain representations of similar uh, images. So if I show an image to a neural network, and then I show the same image to a person in an fMRI scanner, the brain activity I record with the fMRI scanner creates a representation that has similarities to the neural network representations. And when I say similarities, specifically what I mean is, if I looked at how similar your brain's representation is for cat and dog, Cat and dog would be more similar to each other than cat and house. But, and if I looked in the neural network representations, the same patterns would be true. Cat and dog are, have representations that are more similar than cat is to house. And so we're not talking about a particular neuron in the human brain having anything to do with the neuron in a neural network. Rather, we're talking about um, the, the similarity between representations for particular things those similarities are respected and, and consistent across the two, what we would call representational spaces. So the way the neural network represents those, that input data and the way your brain represents that input data, there are relationships between them. And the same thing holds for language. So I actually mostly work on language and we train language models that neural network models that take an input sequence of text and produces output a prediction for what the next word might be. And, and as they do that, just like the convolutional neural network on images, they produce representations. They produce a representation of the input text that is useful for trying to predict that next word in the sequence. And again, those representations have a relationship to the human brain in a very similar way that similar words um, will have more similar representations, both in the neural network space and also in brain activity of people reading those words. Wow. That is so cool. Like, so, so, so cool. I think so it's cool too. <laughs> I, I can't believe that, but I'm I mean, like, I can, but I can't. It makes logical sense that the mm -hmm. way our brains are thinking about these things is similar to the way that language models are associating. That's the language that I use and are using the technical terms of representations, but I think of it as the associations between those things. It makes sense that the associations between cat and dog would be much clearer and much more similar than those between cat and house. Right, exactly. That's so fascinating that you've been able to prove this in research. Mm -hmm. And it also opens doors into studying both the brain and also neural networks to see uh, where information appears in the brain, what time it appears, how it moves through the brain, because we have these representations that are a good match. Wow. Wow. This is amazing. And, you know, I, I have to dig in here a little bit, which may not be <laughs> the, uh, a good idea, but I gotta, I gotta ask, you know, when you talk about probability of the next word and guessing the next word, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is OpenAI's GPT-3. Mm -hmm. We've been playing with it since June, 2020, among the first six, 700 companies in the world to have access. And I know that number's well into the 70,000s last time I checked, which was probably six months ago. And so, you know, when you think about the work you're doing on understanding the probability and guessing the next word, and you look at other models like this, talk to me and compare for me and our listeners what you're doing in that space versus what GPT-3 and OpenAI has done, perhaps where you or they have 
made amazing gains in the field and perhaps where there are some limitations. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So I think all of the language technologies that are coming in now are amazing. I think we've come so far in the last like five years. The the sorts of text that are generated by those models now is very convincingly human most of the time. Um, and of course there are corner cases and people love to pick out those corner cases, but they're, I think by and large, we've really, you know, entered into a new era of language modeling, which is awesome. But there are still places where language models fail and they fail often in common sense reasoning. They fail in inference. Uh, so, you know, something that isn't directly said in the text, but could easily be answered by a human because they understand the text at a different level. Those are the sorts of things that are missing in um, even GP. And those are the sorts of places where I think trying to understand what the brain is doing could help us to build better models. And so one of the things I, I am working on is using brain imaging to actually help to teach the network what it should be representing. So I told you that there's a relationship between the representations in the human brain and the representations in neural networks, but they're not perfect. And so the question is, could we use our brain imaging data to help guide the neural networks to create representations that are better because they're a closer match to the human brain? And there's you know some early evidence that that is a uh, possible and a useful uh, way to go forward. And I think moving forward, I mean, there's multiple ways to do it. You could literally take brain imaging data and use that to improve networks, but also just taking inspiration from how are people doing common sense reasoning? How do we do inference? Talking to people in psychology and trying to understand what they've found, because of course they've been, they've been studying those things for a long time. And how can we get neural networks to do similar things? And there's, you know, branches of research studying each of those. Boom. Ooh, this is getting so, so exciting. All right. So when you talk about common sense and inference, I want to, I want to go down on this a little bit more on the common sense side. One of the things we've even seen with much more basic natural language processing than I think what you're doing uh, is struggling to understand idioms or cliches or, you know, little sayings that we have and, and especially culturally right? These are very culturally anchored. They're extremely localized. Mm -hmm. I know with my travels between Canada and the States, there's sometimes, oh, that's a very American thing to say, or, oh, that's a very Canadian thing to say. You don't really hear that here. You know, mm -hmm. talk to me a little bit about the challenges and struggles with the common sense piece. I, I know you see a path with better mapping these representations in the brain to helping language models, but how hard is that for machines to master inference and common sense and how far away are we for them to do that especially given the localization of these quote-unquote common sense ideas yeah yeah so you're right that the that the idea of common sense um changes depending on where you are there's i, I live in edmonton alberta and i have a lot of common sense about driving in the snow <laughs> that people in another part of the world would not have and i also don't have you know some common sense about what you should do when it's you know 42 degrees it's so we all have our own common sense. You're right that it's very area specific, but we also have a lot of things that are shared and understood sort of across. I think at least the, the first steps are making sure that the sorts of common sense that are shared across some cultures is the place to start. Um, and then you're right, though, that having models fine tuned to specific cultures is important uh, and being, you know, cognizant and aware of the fact that models, huge models trained on texts you find from the Internet are going to be full of problems uh, when you try to use them in specific locales. Yeah, absolutely. And and how far away are we, do you think, if you had to, just just putting you on the spot here very casually, um, how far away do you think, like how many decades, how many years from machines having it, maybe even just if we just narrow it to the global common sense, just that, just what we see that cross cuts culture, how far away are we from machines, maybe even getting a better grasp of that? I mean, it really depends. But and so, I mean, I, I think it's a moving bar. It's a moving goalpost. I mean, this is something I do when I teach uh, natural language processing is I'll start a class off by saying, what would it take for me to convince you that, that computers understand language? And they'll give me a set of things. Like, so in the past, people have said translate between languages. Well, so they don't tell me that anymore because they know that machines can do that. And I add through the course of the, the, the course of the course, I will show them that the things that they said they would they need in order to believe that computers understand language have already been done. And then they will tell me new things and I will show them that those have already been done and so on and so forth. And that's how the class progresses. And I think that that's how things will progress for uh, language technologies in general. Right now we think, okay, so if we could only get them to do common sense language, uh, whatever common sense means across culture, if they could do that, then they would be like, you know, they'd be really good models. But every time we get to that goalpost, 
it's moved, right? And we're like, well, that's not quite good enough. It's still not doing this thing. So, you know, when do I think it will have a global model of common sense? I mean, I don't know when that will happen, but it doesn't, in some ways it doesn't matter because that's not the end goal, you know? Correct. And so what yeah. the final end goal is something like, you know, general intelligence. And that, I, I think decades, if ever, yeah, I think we have lots of work left to do. So we like yeah. to talk about the successes in artificial intelligence. So we often don't talk about the failures, but in research, we certainly see how these um, models don't always work as we expect them to do. And they can be quite fragile. And, you know, there's lots of things that we do that, that doesn't pan out. Sometimes it seems more amazing from the outside than the inside. I still think we're quite far away from, well, anything like general intelligence. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's so funny when you hear people talk in the, in the general community versus people like yourself in the AI community. It's it's night and day what people think around the capabilities. But I, I love the way you run that class. That sound I mean, that sounds cool. I want to I want to be in that class. You know, what would it take? What would it take? Oh, achieved, achieved. We've done that. We've done that. That that's awesome. And that's that's a really neat way of showing all the progress that hasn't made in the field. And I know we had touched on this briefly before we started recording as well, you know, the fact that what used to be PhD thesis projects like high school students are doing this in an afternoon project. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. it's wild. Yeah. I know I recently was in my lab meeting and it sort of became apparent that people were, didn't completely understand what was happening in the training of the neural network and backprop wasn't completely understood by everybody in the room. And that's because there's these beautiful packages. Now you don't have to understand backprop in order to build these models anymore. But when I was a student, you know, uphill in the snow, both ways, I had to, you know, implement that stuff myself. I had to compute the gradient by hand on paper and then program it. And like, that's how we used to do it. And now there's these, you know, these libraries that like, it blows my mind that that, that work that was so painstaking is now something that happens automatically behind the scenes. It's awesome. And it does, it does open up a whole new world, but it also means that people can take a step back from the models and maybe not understand them as deeply as they would otherwise, which sometimes is fine. As we talked about at the beginning, it depends on what you want to do. Uh, sometimes it's fine to not under completely understand how back prop works. And then sometimes you should really, you know, make sure you understand. And that, and that depends, just like you yeah. said at the beginning, it depends if you want to be one of the people building new packages or one of the people leveraging packages. And I mean, I'm always going to be a fan of accessibility and, and more people being able to use these technologies, even if perhaps the understanding is certainly not at your level, because even I'm not there <laughs> I've been working in this field for a few years, but it goes back to what you said. What do you need to understand to understand this and whether or not you even need to understand those things to understand what's happening, right? Can you make inferences on the output without knowing the things that you need to understand to understand it? And, mm -hmm. and that's really fascinating. Now we've, we've spent some time, we've touched on research, we've touched on what you're thinking about and teaching and, and the Alberta piece. I'd love to look at CIFAR. I'd, I'd love to hear more about your involvement with that organization before diving into the future of AI. So tell me a little bit more as, as a Canadian chair for, uh, a Canadian AI chair for CIFAR. Yeah, so CIFAR is a fantastic organization. They have the attitude that we should fund people, not projects. And so I was lucky enough to have be part of their incoming, first incoming cohort of a CIFAR Azraeli Global Scholars, which was an amazing program with funding wow. associated with it, but also, with amazing leadership training and the connections to, to researchers, world-class researchers that I would never have met otherwise, you know, to have, be able to stand in line for coffee next to Adrian Owen and Janet Worker and Mel Goodale. These are like, you know, amazing brain and consciousness researchers. I would never have, you know, never have met. So the sorts of networking that they enable really was transformative to my career. And I have ongoing collaborations with some of those people now. It has changed my research trajectory. And then as part of the um, Pan-Canadian AI challenge, uh, AI, AI strategy, they again are, are funding people. So, you know, who are the leaders in AI in Canada? Let's find those people and let's enable them to do the research that they think is important without having this overhead of having to sort of explain, explain what you want to do in like these, you know, very complicated and onerous grant application. So grant app, I just wrote a grant application and it took me three months. And then the last week was like, you know, pure working on this thing, writing, checking, because, you know, every, every I has to be dotted and T crossed. It's really important. 
And that takes a lot of time away from the research I could be doing. So CIFAR has this attitude that like, let's find those people. They have a proven track record of doing good things. Let's just let them do good things and see what happens. And it's been really empowering. And I think the sort of research coming out of all three of the centers has been uh, amazing. And it's also created this community amongst the three centers. Uh, that's really excited to, I'm really excited to be part of. And again, meet the kind of research I was, research that I would never have the opportunity to reach otherwise. Uh, and the kinds of collaborations, I think it's really exciting. That's incredible. I mean, first, congratulations. What an honor. That That's amazing. And, you know, second, it brings up for me a lot of just getting in the room, getting in the room, and, and certainly for AI, but in any industry, really, what it takes to just get in the room and how that can transform your career. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing a lot of that in your response. And that's something that, you know, I really hope our listeners are thinking about as they think about the ways to cultivate their own careers and the various career trajectories we'll have across these now, what, 40, 50, 60 year careers that we're having now, right? Mm -hmm. So, wow, what an amazing jumpstart. And me. I want to also make the point that that like getting in the room goes both ways. So once you're in the room, making sure that you help to bring other new people into the room also. I can't see it because this is just a recording, but I was like raising my hands in the air, cheering like, yes, say it again, say it again, Nolana. I was like, absolutely. Who are you bringing with you? Mm -hmm. Who are you pulling up a chair for beside you? Absolutely. I, I love that. It's, it's kind of neat to me, this whole concept of investing in people, not projects. And I'm a, I'm a big believer in this and have experienced it with other government programs in, in Ontario. And it almost sounds a little like you're getting the best of both worlds because it sounds a little private sectory. Like you have a track record of doing good things and we're just going to let you do good things which is, like you said, extremely unusual for academia, which usually has these three-month-long painstaking grant applications and have dabbled in that area too. And whew, don't envy you. It yeah. is so much work. You yeah. do a couple of them, I'm like, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know how you do this for like your whole life. Yeah, right. And so CIFAR is the kind of organization that makes it possible to, I mean, at least do a little bit less of it. You know, we still have yeah. to do some fundraising, but certainly the pressure is off. And I know that when I do fundraising, it's because I, there's a, you know, a collaboration I'm interested in pursuing or something else. Yeah. But that's so powerful, right? Investing mm -hmm. in the people piece. And that's something that we hear a lot about Canada. Canada has these amazing AI researchers, incredible talent, incredible knowledge, AI leadership, et cetera, et cetera. But I would question to what extent we're capturing certainly in the capital markets, you know, to what extent are we capturing the value in our GDP of all this knowledge and talent? And I'm wondering, again, this is my private sector skew, <laughs> but a love of academia at heart, uh, you know, maybe if you have any comments or thoughts on that, like all this knowledge, all this talent, all this leadership, and, and how can we as a country perhaps leverage that? And, and just to take it one step further, because why not? You're in Alberta, you're in Edmonton. Is this not what we need to do for the future of Canada, to diversify the mix of our GDP, to increase our ability to meet our climate goals, right? Is this yes. not part of it? Do we not need to capture, yes. from a GDP standpoint, the brilliance of all these amazing researchers like you? Yeah, I'm on your team there for sure. Like I've said it over and over again that cutting Alberta education, you may know that there have been big cuts to post-secondary education in Alberta. I think given the way that the, you know, technology is changing and resources are changing, we can't be cutting post-secondary education because it's so important. It is the thing that will, you know, raise up the people who need to change careers like that and give them the sorts of education that aren't tied to specific technologies, like I was saying. So give you the kind of education that lasts for decades instead of, you know, a few years. That happens at universities and it's very important when, you know, the ground under you is shifting and, you know, resources are changing. We, we need to have those long-term plans where we get people re-educated and we're not raising tuition by 7% a year for three years and making it out of reach for people once they, you know, come back and need to be re-educated. I think, or retrained, I should say. I think it's, I, you know, something that frustrates me. And I think also that the value of the university is hard to measure because it, it's, you, it is a long-term thing. The value of a university isn't something that shows up next year value of a university is over, you know, many years, you know, and even if you think of, you know, 
all, the majority of the money that I get from CIFAR is spent on people. It's spent on students living in Edmonton so that they can do their degree in Edmonton. And so all, you know, a large majority of the money that I get for research goes into the economy in Edmonton because the students I have here live here and they work, you know, they buy products here, they eat here, they're, you know, they're citizens. And so they, you know, contribute to the local economy. So the research funding that we bring in to the University of Alberta, a lot of it stays here. And that's, you know, really important. And it's millions and millions of dollars. I actually don't know how much it is, but it's definitely more than billions of dollars. Than it <laughs> it's has. a lot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, and I, that's a, a really great point is that the, these amazing researchers like yourselves and the next generation of researchers are in the community and contributing back to the community. And when you're funded uh, a little bit better than scraping by, you're contributing back to your community and that is driving the economy. It's it's fascinating to me. Is is And I, I have to ask, do you ever see a world in which or a future in which you're in the private sector or are you the, the researcher where I need to call you in five years and 10 years or less and I need to say, Alana, we got a partner on this. <laughs> uh, so I did, I actually used to work in industry. I worked at Google for a, a few years, which I really enjoyed and I learned a huge amount. And But I will, and I say like the pull of industry is strong. Um, but I think for right now, I really like the autonomy I have in academia and that I can I could basically reinvent myself whenever I want. I could start working on something different if I want. And that's something that's harder to do within a, within a company. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that is, is something we're actually seeing play out right now with Google. Uh, so <laughs> have, have a little, no pun intended, Google on uh, <laughs> AI research and ethics in Google. And oh boy, yeah. you're going to see a lot there. So yes. glad that you have that, that freedom and uh, the resources here. This is amazing. Well, I hope that we find a way to better, you know, monetize as a country for our own GDP and for our own future and for our own continued wealth building uh, to continue to be a nation that offers great social security programs for the populace that needs to be driven by some capital. It's got to come from somewhere. So I really hope that we as a country can figure out ways to better monetize your brilliance and the brilliance of all your colleagues, because the work you're doing is the future, full stop, period. And we need you and we're grateful for you. And this is extremely exciting. Speaking of, let's go into the future of AI. And so I'd like to start by asking beyond your work, which obviously you're very excited about, what that you're just seeing out there in the world of AI, which is very big and broad, what is exciting you in the AI space right now? So, I mean, as I said, language models absolutely have become remarkable and i also love that so there are ethical questions around releasing these really powerful language models but it also means that my research group can start with a pre-trained model that's already extremely powerful and then do further training on it to get it to do something else the sorts of things that those models can do it completely blows my mind like the sorts of like further training you can do it's miraculous and it's in, it's enabled by people releasing those models and it means also that all of the resources that went into training that model, because we're talking a huge carbon in, uh, footprint for those sorts of models, is reused over and over and over again. And that's so important. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. I will also say, though, a little pet, uh, pet interest of mine is self-driving cars. And I had a bet that I made in 2014 that there would be self-driving cabs in somewhere in North America by 2024. And I believe I have won that bet now. I believe there are hireable self-driving cars cabs with no driver that you can hire in Arizona. I was going to say it's in, it's in Phoenix, it's in, Arizona, yeah. uh, or maybe not Phoenix, but it is in Arizona. You're hundred percent. I, right. I saw that. Yeah. And so I, I think that, that I, I, I actually, I don't really like driving and I, for the most part would rather bike or take tra public transport. And I am so looking forward to the day that like, I can just uh, like hire an Uber, except there's no, like it's, Nobody owns cars, but like cars are not a thing we own anymore. And they just are available because think of the number of cars right now sitting, doing nothing, taking up space in parking spots or just in front of houses, the huge garages we have for our multiple. I'm looking forward to the day when we can say goodbye to owning our own cars. And I'm, I'm excited to see that happen. And on the, of course, all of the things that happen because people are not the best drivers, right? You know, I, I was listening to Malcolm Gladwell say on a different podcast that you know, we may have children who have never seen a car accident. And I have young children in that. I mean, I think that would be a lovely thing if they never had to see the kind of carnage that can happen when cars collide. Oh, I mean, I'm with you. I even remember 
years ago thinking how archaic we're going to think this is that we would give 16, 17 year olds, or frankly, anyone without a fully developed prefrontal lobe, which is like, what, 24, you know, the fact that we give anyone, yeah, just to drive this two ton death machine, but please stay within these painted lines. Thank you. Yes. Have a good day. Like, and, what and, do, and, and don't text, <laughs> yeah, don't text on the don't. phone. You're literally addicted to. <laughs> Yeah, that we that we designed to addict to be you. addictive. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. My yeah. goodness. Now, self driving cars are very, very cool. I also love the accessibility angle. Big transit believer myself, but also just thinking of of folks uh, who have mobility issues yeah. and don't have to rely on the specific city bus or very expensive private transport. Totally. Yeah. Or um, you know, folks with vision uh, challenges, especially if you think about aging, right? Pretty sure my grandfather was driving to like 85, 87, like yikes, but also, you know, he should be able to have independence and go to places yes, he wants to absolutely. go. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> yeah, let's make it happen. Exactly. I'm, I'm with you. This is very cool. As we, as we come towards the end of our time together, this has been absolutely fascinating. And I know that our listeners are going to learn so much and you've, you've really left us with some gems and nuggets on wide ranging right? The, the research you do, education itself, we even touched on self-driving cars and, and industry. I'd love to, if you can succinctly, kind of map your journey, because we always want to hear, you know, what was your journey getting into AI? To maybe paint the picture for our listeners of how their journey could, could also end up with them having a career in AI like you. Yeah, so uh, as an undergrad, I did an internship with a research lab, but I sort of fell into it because I had already, I had actually already set up my own, an internship. I was going to work for a big company um, and I did another interview just sort of on a whim and it ended up being machine learning for bioinformatics, uh, which was like at the time I had a sort of interest in genetics. So it, it ended up being a perfect fit for me. And so I'm not sure what the lesson there is for people outside, but maybe the lesson is to keep keep your keep your heart open and and think of you know don't say no to to too many opportunities even if they seem like they might not be I certainly say probably say yes too much so then I you know I did I did my I did I worked for them for a few years in that research lab and then did a master's and then worked for Google and then did a PhD and then, I don't know how much of that is really re replicable but I think sort of keeping your eyes open and for opportunities even if you're not completely sure that they're the best fit Absolutely. And, and that is the serendipity, I believe, mm -hmm. of careers. that serendipity, that randomness that you cannot possibly pre-plan. And you, you know, for our listeners, I'm like, oh, give them a map, give them a show them a roadmap. But part of that is also to say there is no roadmap yeah. because they couldn't possibly replicate what steps you took in your career, what our other uh, guests have taken, you know, even my own steps in my career. Like it's just that serendipity, that magic leaving room for that. So that's a, that's a good, that's a good takeaway. Is there anything else you'd like to leave our listeners with? Uh, I guess I would just say that AI is amazing and powerful, but we also need to consider how it affects different groups of people. And so the language models that we train, we train on text from the internet and the internet is full uh, of hateful speech. And that's a problem. And we need to think about the implications of the models that we build and uh, release out into the world. Um, it's not uh, all rosy. There's a lot of ethical implications to AI research. Absolutely. And this just makes me think of Microsoft's Taylor bot way back when. So yeah, lots to think about. So let's, on that note, consider these hefty ethical considerations. And of course, we want to thank our sponsors, Microsoft Canada and Cinchi. And remember, Send us your questions, feedback, and community news to info at askai.org. And let's thank Dr. Alana Fish for being with us today. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks for listening to the Ask AI podcast. The sponsors of this episode were Microsoft Canada, producers of the Free AI Business School, and Cinchi, the dataware platform that makes integration obsolete. The series producer was Chris McClellan. The series editor was James Fajardo. Original music was provided by Mike Letourneau. To learn how to be featured on our podcast and get information about sponsorship and volunteering opportunities, please visit our website at askai.org 
send us an email to info at askai.org, or talk to our bot by visiting askai.org forward stroke chatbot.